Greetings, church. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. My name is Josh, and I serve as the pastor here at Belfield. I'm glad that you found us for this online service. I hope that you also visit our website, belfield.org, and our social media feeds, our weekly newsletter there, because all the information and updates that you will need are there, along with a lot of other resources to just encourage and strengthen you as you go about your week. Now, we are starting to take some steps uh, towards regathering together, and we have a transitional plan in place for that. We started to share that last week, and I just want to remind you of what that is at this time. Our goal is to get back into uh, the sanctuary to have opportunities to worship there. There's a little bit of work that we still need to do to be fully ready for that. So in the meantime, we will produce these worship at home videos. Those will be posted, and you can watch those alongside others Sunday morning if you would like. And then at 5 p.m. Sunday afternoons, uh, for those who are comfortable or able to attend, we are going to have a simple outdoor service on our front patio. This is meant to supplement the online service. It's a little bit different in content and to provide a time for people to gather together responsibly and faithfully in worship. Now, as we get closer to being ready to be in the sanctuary, we will, of course, keep you updated on the timing and the progress in that. But we are looking for ways where we can take steps forward as we worship the Lord and regather together as his people. Now about today's service, this is led by some of our staff, some of our elders and deacons, members in the congregation, and they do that from within their own homes. This is a way to to try to nurture community, even in our distance from one another. And you'll hear musical leadership from some of our different services. There will be different styles there. But this is an opportunity to participate. I know I invite you to do that every week. Please do. Don't just watch this. Participate. Sing with us during the songs, pray with us during the prayers, have your Bible out and open as we are studying God's Word together. This is a way that we can worship even when we're not right next to each other. We're going to enter into that time today with an opening scripture and a call to worship. Good morning, Belfield family. My name is Shelby Scott, and it's so great to be joining you from Alexandria, Virginia. This morning's call to worship is from Psalm 40, 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Would you please pray with me? O God, the author and foundation of hope, enable us to rely with confident expectation on your promises knowing that the trials and sorrows of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed, and having our faces steadfastly set toward the day when you will make all things new. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hello, Belfield family. We are Greg and Jeanette Kreutzer. We're so happy to be with you today. God has revealed himself to us through his word and through his son. Let's worship him now.
Hello, Belfield family. We're the McElhans. I'm Kent. And I'm Martha. And we have the prayer of confession. So when we worship, we're praising God for who he is and what he has done for us. When we take time to confess, we're acknowledging that God is holy and we are not, and that we are in need of his grace and mercy. Please join me as we pray. pray. Let's bow our heads. Righteous Father, we who own more than we use, proclaim more than we experience and request more than we need, come asking your forgiveness. We seek your salvation, then act like we save ourselves. We beg your forgiveness, then repeat our errors. We experience your grace, then act defeated. We rely on your power, but only in hard times. We have become confused and misguided. Forgive our every defection. Bring us to an unbroken commitment and a steady trust through Jesus Christ, who's the way of hope, the truth of God, and the life of love, now and always. Amen. Our assurance of pardon today is from John chapter 6, verses 37 to 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Jones and I'm your youth leader here at Belfield. Today I had the pleasure of singing with Molly Smith, one of our high school students. We've been really excited to share this duet with you and we hope you will join your voices with ours in praise to our Lord. Let's worship together.
Hello, Belfield. We're the Burdettes. I'm Jenna. And I'm Greg. I'm on staff here. And Noah and I regularly attend the morning services, um, or we watch from home like all of you. Um, would you join me as we read today's first scripture reading? Today we're reading from Malachi chapter 2, 17 through chapter 3, verse 5. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Our missionaries of the month for this month are Jess and Iman Perez. Uh, They are the directors of Aselsi uh, down in Guatemala, uh, one of our main partner ministries. And our ministry team of the month is the children and youth team uh, and VBS just wrapped up this week, so we're going to be praying for them and um, for what God has and will do uh, through, uh, through VBS. So would you join us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we can be united uh, together as a body uh, by your spirit, even when we are separated physically. Um, Lord, we thank you that we can bring our cares and concerns before you, that uh, we can approach your throne uh, confidently, knowing that uh, we are dressed in the righteousness of Christ, uh, and that you love to hear our requests, and you're a good Father that gives us good things. So Lord, we, uh, we bring our requests before you. We do pray for uh, Jess and Iman and all of us, Elsie, uh, Lord, that you would be sustaining them, in this time, be providing uh, for them as a ministry. Uh, Lord, I I pray to be protecting uh, their family and and the rest of the ministry uh, from this virus, uh, be keeping them safe uh, in this time. Lord, I I also pray that you would allow them to to continue to proclaim the gospel in word and in deed, uh, even during these uh, restricted, um, uh, even, even, even during these restrictive times, Lord. I pray for the children and youth team. I thank you for VBS and uh, for the kids that were able to come and uh, the the families that were able to host uh, this year. Lord, I I pray that the work that you have begun in the lives of the kids there, uh, that you would continue that work and bring it to fruition. And Lord, bless all the work of the children and youth team. uh, And I pray that even uh, VBS would be an encouragement to them. Of, uh, of how you are moving in the lives of the children here. Lord, we pray for our country uh, in this time. Lord, we pray for our leaders, um, those that are leading our denomination and our churches, uh, and those that are leading our government. Lord, I, I pray that you would give them uh, wisdom in, uh, in these difficult times, um, help them to seek after you uh, and to be humble. Uh, and Lord, I, uh, I pray that uh, we, would, um, we would continue to lift them up uh, in prayer uh, as a country. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for uh, our nation as we uh, wrestle with um, these wounds of racism uh, that uh, have been coming to the surface uh, um, uh, greatly now. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that us as a, as a church would respond with, uh, with wisdom and courage. Um, Lord, help us to care for, for those around us and to uh, seek justice. Uh, and uh, Lord, help us to, to start to do the hard work of, of racial reconciliation and to, um, 
uh, and to care for our black brothers and sisters uh, in the church. Lord, I, uh, I pray for um, all of those who are mourning in this time uh, from, from loss. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for the Woolies and for the Cosentinos, for the Georges, for the Milkies, uh, for all others who are um, uh, mourning lost loved ones uh, in this season. Lord, I, I pray that you would be comforting them and be, be close to them and uh, giving them the hope of the gospel and the resurrection. Pray for uh, healthcare workers who are caring for those who are sick uh, with, uh, with coronavirus. Lord, I, I pray that you would be protecting them and giving them courage. Uh, Lord, be, be healing those who are sick. Uh, and Lord, help us as a, as a community, as a nation, to come around them uh, and, uh, and care for them. And Lord, as we, uh, as we give uh, out of the abundance that you have given to us, Lord, I, I pray that you would use uh, our gifts um, that come from you, Lord, uh, to, to benefit your kingdom. Uh, and Lord, that we would give generously uh, with, uh, with glad hearts. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever we give back to the Lord, it is a part of our discipleship. It's a way that we steward the things that God has given us. It's also a part of our worship. Thank you again for your continued tithes and offerings. As, as I share with you each week, it has allowed our ministries to continue during this time and also helped us to start a, a couple of new initiatives and ways to reach out to our community. So uh, we appreciate that, your faithfulness in those areas. All the information about giving can be found on our website, belfield.org slash giving. Online giving is still the easiest way for us and for most of you, though you can mail things into the office and there are other opportunities and options even available there on the website. In the next moment or two, as you listen to this offertory, we'd invite you to uh, look at some of the prayer requests that will continue to be shared on the screen during that time and to use this as an opportunity to prepare your hearts and minds before we open God's Word together. Okay, it's time for us to get into God's Word together, so I hope that you will have a uh, Bible out and open in front of you somewhere. We'll be in 1 Peter, that's right near to the very end of the New Testament, and I hope you'll have that out as we go here. I don't know about all you, but I have completely lost track of how often I've heard the expression, unprecedented times in recent months. Now, to be certain, there are things going on in our world right now that many of us have never experienced before. And yet the underlying dynamics, the, the chronic disease below the presenting symptoms, if you will, 
Those things are not unprecedented. The human heart is corrupted by sin. It always has been. The societies that we create are warped and wicked. They always have been. Creation itself longs and groans for redemption, just as it always has ever since sin and death first entered into this world. There is hardship in life. And there always has been. But there is hope. And there always has been. One of Jesus' closest companions during his earthly ministry writes all about these ideas of hardship and hope. And that's what we've been looking at in this little sermon series in 1 Peter. Uh, it's one of the letters that Peter wrote to the early church, and he talks all about the difficulties, the sufferings of life. But he also talks about the unshakable hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We're calling this little series Subsequent Glories. That, that's an expression that Peter used back in chapter 1, and I think it's a great way to summarize uh, some of the themes of the entire letter. So we're going to get back into those once more today. Before we do that, would you join me as we pray? Holy God, we long to hear your voice over the busyness and the chaos of this world, and we praise you because you have spoken to us. Lord, give us ears to hear your word this day. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus, the Christ. Amen. We open this series with a uh, kind of an overview of all of chapter one, because that's a place where Peter sets forth most all of the themes that he's going to get into. And what we've done since then is take some particular passages throughout the letter that get a little bit more deeply into some of these themes and really try to see what's going on there. So one theme, perhaps even the main theme of the entire letter that Peter introduced back in chapter one is the suffering that we face, how that's related to our identity in Jesus Christ and, and how that can give us a, a new way of understanding and navigating the difficulties that we face. So he, here's where he first brought that idea up. This is back in first Peter chapter one. These are verses six through seven. Peter writes, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said there are things that will be difficult, things that will test and try your faith, and yet there's a hope that's there. Now, the idea that we get into, those ideas are ones we see a lot more in this particular passage. So we're going to look today at chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. And I invite you to listen again now to the word of the Lord. Peter writes, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, the passage before this, chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, it is another great one. It's one that I really particularly like. There are a lot of important truths there. The reason that I'm not touching on that one is that I preached on that passage not all that long ago. So we're going to uh, put that one, repost that in our podcast feed if you want to go back and hear some thoughts on verses 7 to 11. This particular passage, though, strikes me as especially relevant for uh, some of the things that we have all been experiencing, some reminders that we need to hear, and what Peter tells us is true about our suffering. Now, it's important to understand that there are, there are different forms of suffering, there are different causes of suffering. There was an incredible news story that came out of the Yunnan province in China back in 2011. A 37-year-old man named Li Fu went to the doctor because he had been having these constant and almost debilitating headaches, and they'd been going on for several months. So he told the doctor this, and the doctors performed uh, some routine x-rays. And what they found, though, was anything but routine. They found that uh, Lee had a four-inch knife blade embedded in his head. 
Turns out that he had been the victim of an armed robbery five years before that, and, and he knew that the attacker had assaulted him, but he had no idea that part of the blade broke off and it had been lodged in his brain this entire time. Doctors said it was an absolute miracle that he survived the attack. And they were also incredibly able to remove a piece or remove that piece of the blade and, and Lee made a full recovery. You can find some more of the x-rays online and read some of the news coverage of when it first happened if you're curious about this. I think the Los Angeles Times maybe had the best introduction to the story though. Uh, in their article, they said, if you have stabbing pains in the head, maybe it's because you've been stabbed in the head. We need to understand why we're suffering, what produces that. We all experience suffering. That's not, there's no breaking news that I am sharing with you. The first noble truth of Buddhism is all of life is suffering. Now saying all of life is suffering, it may be overstating the case there or something, uh, but we know that that is true. There is this reality that we face in this world. So again, there are different forms, there are different causes. Uh, I introduced this very briefly right at the end of last week, but by way of recap. There's some suffering that's avoidable, and it's just uh, you, it's something that you bring on yourself. So chugging a quart of lemon juice, or sticking your hand into an open flame, or going swimming in the Monongahela River. Nobody told you that was a good idea. You're going to have to deal with the consequences of your own actions there. That's not what Peter's talking about. There's also suffering that is, it, is very inexplicable. It's tragedy. There's no one person's fault that you can point to. So when someone uh, dies or is injured in an accident, when a toddler gets cancer, when a tornado ravages a community, when someone uh, is faced with chronic and untreatable pain in their body, these, these things are heavy, they are hard. There are no easy answers for them. There's nothing we can clearly point to as a cause. That's not what Peter's getting at with this one. There's also suffering that comes from uh, the things that are produced out of a sinful human heart. So hatred, violence, deception, racism, greed, jealousy, lies, all of the things that manifest themselves in what we say and what we do and in the cultures that we create because of our sinful hearts. Peter's not getting at that either. He's getting at a very particular kind of suffering here, and he addresses it when he says it's suffering in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Here's what he said in verse 15 once again. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Uh, the meddler kind of sounds like a, a B-list supervillain, doesn't it? Peter's saying here, look, don't suffer because of your own sinful behavior and the consequences that generates. Don't do that. Then he goes right after that in verse 16 to say, Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And back in verse 13, he had actually gone so far as to say, Rejoice! insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. It's very important to notice that, know that, that Scripture never says, hey, if you can smile big enough, then everything's going to be okay in life. It lets us know that life is hard, but God is good. It tells us that the sufferings of Jesus Christ and the sufferings of those who belong to Jesus Christ are things that we need to understand and that Scripture directs, uh, addresses directly and frequently. So I want to talk about that phrase because it's an interesting one when uh, Peter says, share Christ's sufferings. So let's think about the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Now, on one level, the sufferings of Jesus Christ are unique and unrepeatable. Only Jesus could take the sins of his people upon himself. Only Jesus is the sinless, perfect, righteous Son of God. Only Jesus could bear the divine punishment against sin and not be annihilated. His sufferings are unique. They brought redemption. They don't need to be repeated. In fact, they can't be repeated. The whole book of Hebrews is celebrating this, saying that our great high priest has offered a sacrifice one time for all time, and it's accomplished everything that we need. So there's that element of Christ's sacrifice that are unique and unrepeatable. There are also things we can look at in Christ and Jesus, his life, his sufferings that, that we can share in, that we can imitate in a way. There are sufferings that he experienced simply by living in this world. Hunger, thirst, grief, loss. These are all things that we can share in, things that we experience. There are also sufferings that he underwent because of the self-giving, self-denying, sacrificial love that he offered to others. And we too can imitate this. 
So Peter says we share in Christ's sufferings in those ways, giving of ourselves at all costs even. Now, Peter's, for Peter to bring this up with uh, the original audience, the, the context that he's getting at here, uh, this would have struck a chord. They would have understand this. They would have understood this perfectly. When Peter was writing this, the early church was was beginning to face very harsh persecution from Rome. In fact, it would only be a couple years after this that Peter himself was executed, and this persecution would intensify, and it would lead uh, to some of the famous stories that we hear from even other historians about, like when the Emperor Nero would impale Christians on spikes and then light them on fire and use them as torches at his parties, or when Christians would get fed to the wild animals at the Colosseum. So the first generation of those who were reading these letters, they knew what this meant beyond what we do. In fact, in ways that would stagger our sensibilities. And yet it's important for us to understand in our context the kind of suffering that people still face in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Globally, less has changed than we may think. Now, it's notoriously difficult to get precise numbers, though Uh, the most respected analyses indicate that there were more Christians killed for their faith, martyred for the gospel in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries combined. And in the first 10 years of the 21st century, most estimate that about 1 million Christians were martyred. So this is not just something that was happening in the ancient past. And it's important when we think about our suffering to have a little bit of, of perspective on some of these things. Now, has the church lost some of its social standing in the modern Western world? Are Christians and Christian beliefs sometimes mocked or dismissed in the public square? Yes, undoubtedly that is true. Though though we have a long way to go before understanding this at the level that Peter and some of his first audience did. I mean, holding a belief that is a minority opinion in the latest public opinion poll is a long ways from some of the things that the first Christians were facing. Someone unfollowing you on Twitter might hurt your feelings, though Peter said, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. So this is not to minimize any of the suffering that you or I or any others are facing, but to understand that this is something that God's people have always faced. And we might say, well, why? I mean, if the good news of Jesus is so good, if Jesus himself is so good, why is there pushback against that? Why does it produce these kinds of things? Here's just a couple thoughts on that. If we are wrapped in our sinful pursuits, then we're going to reject Christ's call to be holy. This was brought up just a little bit ago in this chapter. If you want to look back at verses 3 through 5, that's where Peter said, For the time that is past suffice for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. When those are the things you're pursuing, Peter said, yeah, you're going to reject this call to holy living. Another thing that happens is that if we are convinced Uh, If we are convinced that all truth claims are relative, then we can be offended by the exclusiveness of what Jesus says when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If we're persuaded that sin is not really a big deal, that people are inherently good, and that I can earn God's love if I try hard enough, then the claims of the gospel aren't going to make any sense to me. People don't like hearing that they are sinners in need of a Savior that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father, and that his people are supposed to cultivate lives of gentleness, humility, and holiness. So that's why Christ and his gospel generate these kind of responses, why his people often suffer for his sake. And Peter says, do not be surprised by this. Don't think that something strange is happening. Jesus told us that this would happen. Scripture affirms that this is something we will experience in one way or another. So what are we meant to do in those times? What's it meant to accomplish? I want to offer you just three quick thoughts on this. What what this kind of suffering, suffering in the name and for the sake of Jesus, what it does, what it should do. The first is that it should uh, force us, really, to draw near to God. It should lead us to draw near to God. When things get hard, we 
it's just human nature. We just turn somewhere to find strength or solace or comfort. When things get hard, we turn somewhere. Sometimes we turn inward, just uh, relying on our own determination or internal resources. Or we'll turn outward to the things around us, looking for something to numb the discomfort or just distract us. So we turn to screens and fantasies, drugs and alcohol. We'll look for security, but we'll look to the stock market or the job market. We'll look to our leaders, but then we end up idolizing or demonizing them. When things get hard, our first movement has to be to turn to the Lord. It has to be to cry out to God and then be refreshed by his grace and his mercy. So when you suffer, draw near to God. The second thing is that this uh, refines us. It purifies us. These kind of things, these sufferings in the name and for the sake of Jesus, they remove the, the superficial, half-hearted faith that we sometimes have. Now, this is an idea that Peter also brought up back in chapter 1. If you look back to chapter 1, verse 7, when he said, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's saying that these things refine us, they purify our faith, to, to test something. The way that he's using the word there, to test something is to, to reveal its strength and to show the purity of its composition. And the reason he uses this imagery of gold and refining there uh, is that when gold or silver is put to the fire, the impurities are removed. That's how you get rid of the impurities. And the metal becomes all that much more valuable. So our faith is refined, it's purified when we go through these fiery trials. The more that we turn to the Lord in times of trial, the stronger, the more beautiful our faith becomes. It refines us, it purifies our faith. The third thing it does is that it conforms us to the Savior. By grace, through faith, we are united to Jesus Christ. Scripture says we participate in his death and resurrection. You read through the Gospels, and, and you'll notice that Jesus never promises a life of ease and bliss and luxury this side of eternity. So the versions of Christianity that assure you that you're going to have fabulous wealth, a perfect health, and untroubled comfort just so long as you believe deeply enough, those, those are deceptive idols. Those are things that we have fashioned for ourselves in an attempt to, to create some kind of a detour around the path of Jesus. If we want to experience the subsequent glories that Peter talks about, these subsequent glories in Christ that he has secured for us, then we have to see the path that leads us there. It was when Paul was writing to the church in Philippi in Philippians 3 when he said this. He's saying what he desires more than anything else. His desire, he says, is that I may know him, Jesus, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and, by, and that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's saying if we want to attain the resurrection from the dead, if we want to know the power of Christ's resurrection, if we want to share in these subsequent glories, then we've also got to share in his sufferings. We've got to become like Jesus in his death before we become like Jesus in his resurrection. So when we are going through these difficulties, if you are suffering in the name and for the sake of Jesus, it leads us to draw near to God. It refines and it purifies our faith. And it conforms us to the Savior. All of these are good things. All right, almost done. I want to, I want to make one final point here. Uh, and it is the one that might bring the most discomfort and the most comfort. Um, I'm going to see if I can unsettle you and then reground you kind of all here at once because that's what Peter did. So I want to give you a word of warning and then a word of hope. Here's the word of warning. It's found in verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? A little bit ago in this service, we had a reading from the prophet Malachi. You know Malachi. It's one of the minor prophets that you skip through on your way to try to find Matthew in the beginning of the New Testament. Don't skip through them. Don't skip through them. There's incredible stuff there, powerful stuff there. What Malachi is saying in the part that you heard is words that the Lord was relaying to give to his people. And God there says to the people, you weary me 
when you ask, where is this God of justice? And yet you insist on living unjustly. In that passage, God there is using the language of, of refining and purifying gold and silver, just like Peter did. And if you heard that, he said there, I'm going to judge my people because they're living no differently than the world around them. They worship idols. They practice adultery. They lie. They don't pay their workers. They oppress the widow and the fatherless. They thrust aside the sojourner. They do not fear me, God says. So Peter's echoing that same kind of sentiment when he says, it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Now, this is not about uh, pointing your finger at the church from a distance and voicing all your complaints about that institution. If you remember all the things we've seen in this letter, Peter has spent a lot of time reminding us about our corporate identity, that we are the household of God. That's who we are together. So th this is a very sobering reminder. It's a very sobering reminder that we have to examine our own hearts and see the places where we need to repent because the people of God will be the first ones called to give account for whether we have obeyed the gospel of God, as he put it there. That's a very interesting expression, so I just want to say a quick word about that. Obey the gospel of God. The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. It's the announcement that he has died for our sins, been raised for our justification, that he is now ascended into heaven and enthroned as king. This is news, and yet Peter talks about obeying this news. It's a way for him to refer to uh, the way that we are meant to respond to this good news by calling upon Jesus Christ as Lord. And Peter then, right after that in verse 18, quotes from Proverbs 11.31. So the reason that he quoted from Proverbs 11.31 and the full context of, of what he's been writing in this section is he's saying this. He's saying even a righteous person, even a righteous person is saved only because of what Jesus Christ has done. And if judgment begins at the household of God, the only hope that any of us have is to call upon the Lord and to entrust ourselves to his mercy and his grace. Because we know the good news of the gospel, we will be the first called to give account if we are not living in light of it. Older siblings out there, you know what this looks like. Older siblings, you know this dynamic. If you and uh, your younger sibling get caught doing something wrong, you both end up getting in trouble. But what do mom or dad usually say to you at one point? They say, yes, you both messed up, but you should have known better, right? It's a sobering and unsettling reminder that because we know the good news of the gospel, we will be the first called to account if we are not living in light of it. So that's the unsettling part. It is. It's a word of warning. But there's a word of hope that's woven right in the midst of this. You see it a couple places, actually. In verse 13, Peter said this. He said, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad with him when his glory is revealed. He said, rejoice if you are going through some of these things, because it means that you're also going to share in Christ's subsequent glories. You're going to rejoice and be glad when those things are revealed, and those are there for you in him. He also said this in verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. I, that verse could be like the subtitle of this entire letter, I think. He's saying, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. We entrust our souls to our faithful creator because he will never leave us or forsake us. We entrust our souls to our faithful creator because he has redeemed and rescued us. We entrust our souls to our faithful creator because there is nothing that could possibly separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the meantime... We do good. We reach out in love and service to others, and we rejoice in the subsequent glories that will be revealed. Back in March, uh, when our household switched from having two boys in public middle school to having two boys being homeschooled, uh, none of us knew quite what to expect. And, and I know that many of you were in a similar position there. It took a little while for everyone to find their footing. There were definitely some bumps in the road at the beginning. Uh, there are reasons why I am not an algebra teacher. But one of the things that we appreciated is when the teachers uh, would let us know as clearly as possible what was coming. 
when they would communicate as far in advance as they could and let us know this is what is in store. These are the plans that are there. This is what it will look like. Even if it was a challenging process, even if it ended up being a difficult time, it helped to know what was coming. Jesus wanted his disciples to know what was coming when he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome this world. And Jesus, having heard those, or Paul, or Peter rather, Peter, having heard those words directly from Jesus, wanted all the followers of Jesus to know what to expect when he said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. He wants us to know that we need not be ashamed if we suffer in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray together. Holy and loving God, we confess that we are prone to despair when life gets difficult, and that we lose sight of the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. Draw us again to you, refine and strengthen our faith, and conform us to the image of your Son, our Savior, the risen Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hey, Belfield, would you join me in worship as we reflect on how much we need our Lord Jesus Christ in every hour?
Friends, thank you for joining us once again for this time of worship. Don't forget to check out our website and our weekly newsletter for up-to-date information and announcements, resources for you as you go through your week. And remember that we are now having a 5 p.m. Sunday afternoon service outdoors on the patio. So all the information about that is happening, uh, can be found rather in the website as well. But remember, uh, wherever we are, our worship is not complete until it goes out in loving service to others. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.